Without further ado, please join me in welcoming the film's director, Ted Brung. And quick, quick apologies, I think a little tiny snippet of the film was just clipped off at the end accidentally. So do you want to just tell us really quickly, Ted, um, what we missed there? She, uh, Edith Ramirez, the, the uh, chairwoman of the FTC, uh, simply responded to the reporter's question that, um, that she did not endorse the statement that Herbalife was not a pyramid scheme. Okay. And then we have one other special guest joining us. Please join me in welcoming Bill Ackman. Now, are you sweating because it's warm in here? <laughs> or are you sweating because you're reliving the agony and the ecstasy of this situation? You know, I, I, I maybe it sounds strange to most of you, but I just, it, it moves me to tears to watch this. It really does. Oh and God. I went to the men's room and tried to wash off my face, so <laughs> you wouldn't know. Now, when you see yourself, I always ask people this, who they themselves, and whether it's some events in their life or some campaign of theirs or what have you, or this effort you made, when you see yourself portrayed in the film, what's that like? Did you, did you like what you saw when you first saw the film? Uh, I really think it's an important film. Um, I think it's an important uh, subject. You know, the what, part that moves me, you know, when I, when I was in that church in Chicago, um, I also had a prayer circle. Uh, <laughs> I guess I didn't. But, you know, these people are so passionate and... Um, they're, they've been, you know, so harmed, and, I, and I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to help them. It's just very, very frustrating uh, thing. So just watching the film, I, I love this woman, Julie Contreras. I think she's an incredible human being. You know, and, and so, I, so I want her to see, you know, justicia. You know, I want, it's just time. Well, I think, you know, I mean, I don't have, I have like zero business acumen. I'm like the last person you want to give your money to to invest, but. <laughs> um, I know nothing about business and so forth and investing, but when you do this, I mean, you've been extraordinarily successful and, and your company's been extraordinarily successful. So when you make a decision to do this to the extent you can kind of encapsulate for this, how does that work? When you decided to, I don't want to say attack, but if you want to, you know, whatever word you want to use to take on the herbal life situation, over what period of time do you evolve that idea? So the... I had a, an analog, this is my second such uh, adventure like this. Uh, the first was a company was pointed out in the film called MBIA and it took me seven years to be, you know, it, when short selling is something that's inherently unpopular, people think of it as sort of un-American. You're betting against a company. How can that be good for America? And so we, our rule is that we won't short a company unless we think it's good for America for the company to go away, right? So there, fortunately there aren't that many businesses like it. Um, you know, if Madoff were a public company, you know, I hope we would have found it and shorted it and, and gone public to, uh, to expose it. Um, but you, it's a very lonely place to be a short seller because everyone hates you, right? The, the shareholders hate you, the management hates you, and then the, the media, surprisingly, you think of uh, journalists as, you know, investigative journalists would be very interested in the contrarian uh, point of view, um, but Remarkably, uh, they hate hedge fund managers more. <laughs> so, so you know, it's, really? just, it's not a popular, it's not a popular place. So, th this is it's a race to the bottom in terms of yeah, PR. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, so after the MBIA battle, which took seven years and ultimately was very profitable for my investors, I actually, I, what's fascinating about the MBIA example was no one listened to us. The stock would just go up and up and up and up. And then finally one day at one of our many presentations, I said at the very end, I said, everyone says they can't believe me because I have a, a, you know, a profitable interest in the outcome. What's fascinating about that is, by the way, everyone who goes on CNBC to talk about a stock they like also has a profitable outcome, you know, interest in the outcome. You know, Michael Johnson has a, you know, owns millions of stock options. He's got a very you know, incentivized uh, you know, sort of outcome. So in the MBIA case, I said, look, I'll tell you what, I'll give a, I'm going to give away 100% of any money I make from the failure of this company when it fails. The stock was at an all-time high. That was the high. It went from 72 to 3. Uh, firm made a billion and a half dollars. I made $150 million. Now, what's really interesting is when you commit to give away 100% of the profits from something, 
when you're in a loss-making position, it's a really easy thing to commit. But then when you actually make the money and you have to give it away, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Uh, and, I, and I didn't have $150 million to, you know, when I made that bet. Anyway, so that became uh, funds I used to start a foundation. And so you know, a lot of good came from it. And I figured in the Herbalife one, when I launched it, the first day I said, I give away 100% of any money I make from this because I figured that would help address the issue. What I didn't expect was for Carl Icahn to show up. And that is what dramatically changed the outcome here. Did you have a relationship with him before? I mean, you knew each other, obviously, did you? Yeah, we were tight. Yeah, were you buddies? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Carl is... I mean, for Icahn to call you arrogant, I thought, my God, what nerve he has. <laughs> <laughs> he's charming, he's funny, he's a great guy to go have dinner with. Um, I, I bumped into him at the US Open at the finals, it was raining, we talked for hours, you know. We've eventually sort of, sort of made peace on this one, um, but he's a ruthless killer. <laughs> and and by the way, he would, he would consider that a compliment. Yes, I'm sure, he would. I'm sure. <clears throat> now, now, similarly, as he, he selects these projects on a very, very careful basis, watch this segue. <laughs> you uh, select projects you do. What was it about this story that made you want to commit years of your life to make a film about it? Uh, there were two big elements, Alec. One was it had a tremendous element of surprise about it, sort of front-loaded. Uh, hedge fund managers taking big public moral stands are not everyday news, and Bill himself was fascinating. Um, and the other element was that the company itself uh, stood publicly for all sorts of things that most Americans, I think, value. Health, nutrition, and a shot at realizing your dreams. But it was being accused of a pyramid scheme. Something had to give, and I figured whatever way it unfolded would be surprising. And I, as a, as a human being, think that humanity's capacity to surprise one another is, is something that's inherently interesting. The other thing was I had made a film in Sudan um, uh, previously, and while I was there, in a very, very different circumstances from the circumstances of this film, I was sensitized to the role of, of money in American life. It's, it's core place in a lot of our values, and I, I, I thought that this subject matter would allow me to explore that. Um, I, I, I was surprised the film ended up being much more about fact, truth, and justice, uh, though obviously money is the, 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 the medium through which uh, this, this battle took place. The, uh, I remember in the 80s when I first lived in Los Angeles and was looking for work and everywhere you drive around it would say, lose weight now, ask me how. And as you'd head down to LAX, there was a big giant shimmering Herbalife building in uh, yep. Westchester or Playa del Rey, wherever it was. And, uh, and yet in my life since then, I don't see Herbalife or interact with Herbalife in any way. I don't see them. Do they sell a lot of this product in the US or is it mostly overseas? What's interesting is the reason why you saw it then uh, is when Mark uh, Hughes started the company, they originally went after middle class of white people. And so it was very visible to a, you know, you were a middle class white person at the time, I assume. Uh, <laughs> 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 now he's changed. No. <clears throat> but now not they go, now they go after, <laughs> you know, poor Latinos on the south side of Chicago, so they're not, you know, marketing to you. I and mean, the only reason why rich white guys are aware of this is because it's on CNBC every day and it's become a Wall Street story. Um, but in pyramid and the, schemes... And they're on the logo of, uh, I mean, they're on the jersey of the... Right. Uh, I mean, what jo LA Johnson Galaxy professionalized yes. the marketing in a brilliant way and, made, and actually made it a global uh, brand. But uh, you're not the target market. Uh, they, they used up the middle class for the most part and so therefore they had to go find another community in the U.S. But they do sell in the U.S. Sure. But you can't buy it in any store. You have to be approached by a distributor. <clears throat> Now, uh, they say in the, uh, there's that quote, obviously, that it's, it's not a good idea to bring a moral issue to Wall Street. Who is the woman that makes that statement? Christine Richard. Right. And, the woman and, that launched <clears throat> 1,000 ships. It was, her, it was her research that got this all rolling. Right. And then when you were doing this, I mean, I'm assuming that there's a time that you thought, it's time to get out. You must have had some moments of doubt about this whole thing. The only time I considered getting out was that moment which was uh, captured in the film, you know, I, I'm a fiduciary for other people's money. So I can't spend other people's money to pursue a moral campaign of mine. I can make an investment where it's in the best interest of the country, it's morally right for the investment to work out. In fact, if you're a short seller, you want an investment like that because those are ones where the government's most likely to, uh, to take an interest. 
Um, it became a certain point in time where our, our political advisors were saying, look, Bill, it may be the case the government will do nothing here because they're afraid of picking winners with, uh, between a short seller and, a, and a, uh, you know, another billionaire. And I said, you know what, I, I didn't really, when I got into this, I didn't know about the Latino community. I hadn't met the victims. At this point in time, I was like, okay, you know what, let's just wrap it up. And if, if I'm interfering with the government doing the investigation, shutting the company down, then I'll cover the short position. And uh, we had our advisory board meeting, and uh, actually Alan Modell is here, uh, is on our advisory board. And we were literally talking about, I was like, well, let's talk about it. Should, it, should we cover? And that's, you know, literally five minutes later, the trader called in and said Herbalife stocks halted. And that's when the FTC announced uh, its investigation. It was really kind of a remarkable thing. So we stuck with it from an investment perspective because the investment only got better. What I mean by that is, you know, the investigations were launched. We've been working closely with the FTC for you know, a couple of years now. We've been sharing information with them on a very regular basis. And we're very confident they get to the right answer. Now what's fascinating in the film, you know, the story goes on because the FTC came out with the most damning series of findings about Herbalife of any pyramid scheme they've ever, ever gone after. The only difference between their findings here and the other ones is they settled with Herbalife. And they settled with Herbalife because they were afraid. And, which I find no, why, why do you think were, were they afraid of? They were afraid because Herbalife hired Boy Schiller, Herbalife hired Gibson Dunn, uh, Herbalife uh, hired Madeleine Albright, Herbalife uh, spread a lot of money in Washington, um, you know, they, and they were afraid. And so the government, I give a lot of credit to the FTC for their findings, but in order to settle, Herbalife wouldn't settle if the FTC made reference to a pyramid scheme in their settlement. And the FTC focused on just the facts, and to their credit, are making the company change its business in a very dramatic way, which we think will cause ultimately the company to fail. What Herbalife has done is something remarkable. From the date when, when the settlement came out, they leaked to the press that the FTC had determined that they're not a pyramid scheme, which is false, okay? And then that story was picked up by the Wall Street Journal, and that became the narrative, drove the stock price up. The way the press writes stories, if the stock goes up, they assume whatever it is is good, for the company, and that became the narrative, and uh, the narrative has continued. Now, the stock has actually you know, declined somewhat, but ultimately, um, I think you it's think gonna take time. Do you think that they'll be uncovered? Do you think it'll, it'll start to crumble? Yeah, I mean, the FTC found it to be a pyramid scheme. If you take their complaint and compare it with the complaints in Fortune High Tech and uh, this uh, Vima, these two pyramid schemes they shut down, much smaller, they didn't have as good lawyers, they didn't have the political connections, uh, it's identical. You know, the findings are effectively identical. Um, and, uh, you know, the most, there's a, you know, if you look at the, the interviews of these guys, I mean, Johnson is incredibly slick. The president, you know, sitting next to my daughter who's 10 years old, sitting in the back, and she says, Daddy, that guy scares me. That's that guy, Des Walsh. The guy looks like Voldemort. I mean, <laughs> isn't it interesting how crooked people look crooked? <laughs> anyway, but, you know, we're going to get there. It's just a matter of time. And actually, I think the <clears throat> film... Once it's properly distributed, it could have a catalytic effect because I think once people actually understand the story, I think the film does an excellent job in helping people understand the story. So it's interesting where the documentary becomes, you know, kind of like Blackfish, you know, in, uh, with uh, SeaWorld, sure. becomes the catalyst. Well, it reminds me of uh, my, a friend of mine years ago. There was a bar that he really loved. It was his favorite bar. And he would stop by and go there and have a drink, uh, you know, most nights on the way home from work in Hollywood. And it closed. It went out of business. The landlord took away their lease, and they opened up like some kind of a clothing store. And uh, he drove past that corner. He said he drove past every day on his way home from work and, and put a hex on the clothing store <laughs> and prayed that the clothing store would go out of business because it, it, it uprooted his bar. And he said, and sure enough, 18 years later, <laughs> the clothing store closed and went out of business. And I hope that we don't do the Bill Ackman story and there's a scene where you're like 89 years old and in a wheelchair <laughs> and a blanket on your lap by the fire and your grandson says, Grandpa, guess what? Your herbal life is folding. <laughs> <clears throat> but, on, but, on a, but on a serious note, is, is it, so for you, it, it's, you're, you're in it for a longer haul. Yeah, so what I've said publicly is on the investment side, I'll only keep the investment part of it if it makes economic sense for my investors. Sure. Uh, if it, it doesn't make economic sense, I'll cover the short position, but I will pursue it. I, you know, I promised Julie that I will pursue this to the end of the earth, and I will pursue this to the end of the earth, period. 
How, how does this read? Go right ahead. Go. I, 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 this is a this is a terrible thing to say, but it's like in, in, in films you do get seduced by this. You, you come across as like very winning and very charming in the film. You're like a, you're, you're you're very you're almost lovable in the film, you know, in this quixotic kind of way. But 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 the how did this change you? This experience. I, I'm actually very lovable. <laughs> yeah. I don't and and it. the problem is that the, you know, I have this interesting experience. I meet people for the first time and they say, Bill, I had a very different impression of you <laughs> based on what I read in the newspaper. I, I don't know, maybe this movie is I know my the coming out party. You seem actually also like a nice feeling, guy. Bill. I know the film. <laughs> but, 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 but the, um, but. And I'm very charming. Thank you, Bill. Um, now, by the way, we, uh, we, we, we think that this film is just is such a great thing for you that should you eventually win, and you'd like to unload some, some portion of the profits from that situation, the Hamptons International Film Festival will be Done. more than happy. Uh, That's easy. To set up easy. the Bill the way, Ackman Chair in Documentary Filmmaking. So just, just not to forget the victims. What, uh, so we've given $50 million uh, to the undocumented uh, Latino community. So if you want to hear of a couple of good charities, uh, Don Graham, who... Uh, uh, these, I guess the heir to the Washington Post, uh, former CEO of Washington Post Company, started a charitable foundation to fund scholarships for undocumented kids. And what's really sad is that if you're an undocumented kid and, you're, and you were eight years old and your parents brought you here from Mexico and you go to high school in the US and you're with all the other kids you go to school with and you've done really well and you're valedictorian in your class and you're about to graduate, that's when you find out that none of the scholarship programs apply to you because you're, you're not a legal uh, citizen. So he started the scholarship program. We gave $25 million to that. And then we're working with Robin Hood to identify, uh, made a $25 million grant to Robin Hood to help, you know, the community. You know, the investment has been a disaster. You know, we've lost a ton of money, but we didn't want to, you know, make the, the community wait. And so, uh, but, you know, really been an interesting life experience for me. You know, I, I did not know anything about, I didn't even know what the word undocumented really meant. And this is a, you know, the kind of sad thing about the election here you know, getting a little bit of politics. Um, but, you know, everyone in the room here is, is an immigrant, basically. And uh, one of the great things about America is how welcoming we've been for immigrants. And we've got to solve this immigration problem. It's really important. <clears throat> I just want to, before you go, I just want one more question. And, and solving doesn't mean building a wall and sending people to Mexico, so. Right. Uh, were, was there any point where you got nervous, you got scared that you were going to get sued by these people who seem very litigious, some of them, herbal life itself or? Before we left the gates, we were concerned. Right. Right. The, the, I was cautioned by many long-time, very serious journalists that, uh, that we could expect, at the very least, to be sued and, and, and worse. So we, Were you? Not yet. Right. No. <laughs> okay. Um, so that, yeah, that was a concern from the get-go, and, and affected the way we structured the film. We spent, I personally spent, and the, and the production spent the better part of a year um, in active discussions with with Herbalife. I, I met with Michael Johnson privately a couple of times, once alone and once with the producer of the film, Glenn Zipper. Um, I had discussions with several members of the staff. I was interviewed by Gibson Dunn. Um, uh, after about a year, they said, um, look, we're going to stay on the sidelines of this, and we were respectful of that. We continued talking with them up until the time that we locked picture. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, I was concerned about the company's reaction to the film, and um, 12 hours after we premiered at Tribeca, they had an attack site up uh, against us. They swooped in and took uh, a URL, very close to the name of the film, and. Uh, and went after us. And as some people know, Randy Mastro, who's my co-chair of the film festival, is with Gibson Dunn. And <laughs> yeah, he's, he's my co-chair of the festival. And yeah. uh, Randy actually tried to sue Nugent and I to prevent us from showing the film. <laughs> Good, no, I'm kidding. Um, that's a joke. Um, the, uh, but uh, you're not out there, are you, Randy? Um, anyway, um, so did you want to ask a question? Well, no, I guess I'm just wondering now what else uh, could happen with the FTC, or is what happened sort of the final definitive thing? And Well, the, the big question, I think, Bill, you probably have some perspective on this, too, is, is enforcing the, the, the court order once it's signed. Um, the, the, the details of the settlement will, I think, um, completely invert their current business model and, um, and gut the profitability for any of the distributors and therefore the company in the United States. It would seem that way. Um, it'll have to be stringently enforced, but they have a, a set, a, an auditor watching what they're doing for, for seven years. Um, 
So, so basically, uh, the, in 1986, uh, the California Attorney General found Herbalife to be a pyramid scheme, found them making false and misleading statements, and they entered into an $850,000 uh, settlement, and Herbalife committed not to do these various things. That settlement, uh, that permanent injunction was never enforced by the California Attorney General, and Kamala Harris, who is the AG from California, would never meet with us. Uh, she had a thousand complaints from victims in California. She did nothing about them. Why? Because Herbalife is a very politically powerful force in California, and she was interested in running for Senate. I mean, again, this is my interpretation, and she, and she did, did nothing. Herbalife was able to evade the California injunction for 30 years. So I think they view the FTC, well, it's 200 million instead of 850,000, and it's a very strict uh, number of things that they have to do. If, they are, if, they are, if the settlement agreement is enforced, Herbalife dies. Uh, and they also, they'll die more quickly if the, if the distributors leave. And so what they're doing now is they're trying to use the FTC settlement as literally like a good housekeeping seal of approval. And one of the things we did, there's a website you can go to that we created called Facts About Herbalife. We made a little video where we show Edith Ramirez the chairwoman of the FTC talking about the terms of the settlement, and then Michael Johnson in a video to the distributors saying how great this is for the company. And it's one of the most amazing juxtapositions. Um, but I, I give the company 12 months, 18 months, I don't know, something like that. I, I don't think it will survive. I think Michael Johnson goes to jail. That's, and with Des Walsh, I mean, there was another pyramid scheme called Zeke Rewards, uh, which the uh, Department of Justice uh, you know, shut it down recently, and the executives are going to jail. I mean, these, Herbalife has taken $20 billion from poor people in 94 countries. I mean, when you steal $100,000 or you steal TV, you go to jail. These guys stole tens of billions of dollars. The FTC proved it with their two-year investigation. The notion that these people stay out of jail, I think, is a crime. And, and, and yet for people that don't, I mean, you're very, very good with the facts in this film and 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 for people to understand what's going on. But one thing that I wonder is, I mean, the company's formed in 1980, so that's over 35 years ago. And over 35 years, it can't only be people dumping garage fulls of product on other people and expanding. Somewhere people are drinking this stuff and consuming it. Where is that? Well, so first of all, one of the things we learned is that, and actually the FTC found the same thing, is you have poor people buy this product, they can't sell it, what do they do? They eat it, because they have, they, they don't. <laughs> I mean, it actually is sustenance, and you can live on this stuff. For, it's like SlimFast. You can live on it for some period of time. The reason why it can go on for a very long period of time is there are 4 million Herbalife distributors, 2 million quit each year. So they need to find 2 million a year. That sounds like a lot, but there's 7.5 billion people in the country, and there are 94 countries I mean, the world. So you just need to find 2 million. Now, if you have a film that gets wide distribution, and it becomes commonly known in the public domain that the company is a pyramid scheme that will actually have a catalytic effect in protecting more people from being sucked in. What are you working on next? Don't know. The company, I mean... Amway. The, <laughs> the, group, the group that put together this film would, would very much like to make a new picture um, set in the world of American corporate conflict. We have, um, we have a subject that we think will be quite explosive and... Uh, uh, we're not at liberty to reveal it just yet, but... Uh... Actually, can, we, can I ask Ted a question? Sure. Yeah. Is that permitted here? Yeah. So, one of the co controversies, first of all, I had nothing to do with the, creating, the creation of this film, the financing of the film, the yeah. distribution of the film, etc. I mean, I, I, uh, Herbalife, of course. Now, there's, there's a woman, uh, Devin, who's here somewhere, who was the coxswain for the first varsity Harvard crew team. Unfortunately, I was not on the first boat. I was on the third boat, but we were, she was two years ahead of me at Harvard. She's one of the producers for the film. And Herbalife said, aha, I must have been some kind of secret backer. But the backer of the film, who's in the audience, who I met at the, for the first time at the Tribeca Festival, I'm told he's prepared to go public now and say who he is. Is that true? Can we, can we call him out? We could. We, I think it would be sense. very helpful for people to know who actually backed the film, because I think that would help address the... Sure. No, the, 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 the financier of the film is a guy named John Fickthorne. He's in the audience tonight, as he was at the Tribeca premiere. He has a company called Biltmore Films. It's managed by a guy named Burke Kuntz, who's also here in the audience. Um, and as I said, we're very eager to get a new film off the ground. Um, uh, Biltmore Films is up and operating and ready for more business, so. Yeah, can we get the lights up? Right. Yes. Can we bring the lights Please. up real quickly? Let's raise the house lights just a little bit.
And, but that's good right there. And we're going to take some questions. We're only going to take a couple quick questions because we are running long on time. Then I want to make one last comment. Okay. Do we have any questions here? Anybody? Right, right over here. Could you, could you speak loud, please? We got, well, here's your mic. Primarily covered uh, Herbalife's operations in the United States. I'm curious how deep you went into international operations and how the FTC's ruling has impacted the way Herbalife is operating in other countries. Is that a question about the film or about uh, Bill's investment? The film? W the film, we looked, we looked at um, and studied their operations in, in many other countries. We looked particularly closely at Mexico. We also looked at what they were doing in Russia uh, and China. Uh, Ultimately, the, the complexity of the subject itself, and as uh, Alec alluded to, the, the difficulty of just dealing with the facts of the situation um, made us decide to focus on, on U.S. operations. But the, the model and the work that you see um, in, in, in the U.S. Is, is mirrored by what's happening overseas. Another couple questions. We, everybody over here? Right in the back of there with your arm up? Actually, let me just add on to that question because I think Please. what the person was also asking is what does the FTC settlement mean for these yeah. other markets? So the FTC is a U.S. only regulator. They share their work and cooperate with regulators globally. What we're doing is we are meeting with Mexican regulators. You know, when we met with them before, we were a short seller and therefore we have less credibility. Now we can walk in with the FTC's findings, hand them to the regulator in Mexico and China and U.K. and Guatemala. By the way, Herbalife opened Burundi, right? You have to think they're kind of scraping the bottom in terms of the markets they're looking at. I mean, Burundi, I mean, the, the per capita income is like twenty. You wouldn't think these people want to lose weight. I mean, anyway, the whole thing is crazy. Anyway. In the back there, we have somebody's hand up there. Yeah. Bill, thank you very much. It was, it was a great film. The one thing I need to know, though, because in investing, you're not going to just hold on forever, okay? And at some point in time, investment-wise, the guys that got in when you originally shorted it, they have to be bleeding. And, and, and at some point, they would say, hey, I want to cut bait. Like when you buy a stock, you know, to make it simpler, and you expect it to go up, and you buy it at 20, and then you broke it, as it goes to 10, tells you, well, you got to buy more. You know, I mean, the point is, at some point, these people had to say, hey, I've had enough. Sure. Well, we've already we take we, we mark to market every day. So the losses we've had in Herbalife, we've already experienced. Um, you know, like every position in the portfolio, we look at everything every day. I actually think it's the single best time in history to be short Herbalife. We have the findings of the FTC. The stock is trading at near an all-time high. Uh, it's a supplements company. You know, Jim, Jim Cramer on CNBC said on Friday, he said, "Look, it's a supplements company trading at 15 times earnings. You can buy GNC at nine times earnings. So it's an overvalued supplements company." which is being required to completely change its business model. The FTC is requiring Herbalife to only pay its distributors when sales, profitable sales are made to consumers outside the system. Uh, the FTC also found that there weren't profitable sales <laughs> outside the system. So it's a null set in terms of the business going forward. Unfortunately, the FTC is giving them until May to make the changes to the business models. So that's 10 more months of defrauding people uh, under the current model before they go to the next one. So I think it's a great short. I'm not recommending you short stocks. Very risky. They might do a movie about you. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, think it, I think it will be a profitable investment from here, but we'll see. Uh, a couple more, right here. When a lot of us came in, there were people outside who were handing out pamphlets, and they were against this film. Um, I am assuming you also saw them? Yes. And if you did, what was your response to that, and who sent them? So those are, those are people who know nothing about Herbalife, uh, nothing about me, uh, who Herbalife paid. who have paid, not seen the film? Who haven't seen the film, who Herbalife probably paid 100 bucks, 200 bucks to hand out pamphlets. You know, they do this or all the time. Or gave them free shakes. Uh, okay. the, shakes are, the shakes taste terrible, actually. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, you should read the pamphlet. They basically try to imply that I paid for the film, that it's, a, it's not objective. Um, but I encourage you yeah, to read it. You, you on the objectivity it. issue, I just, I mean, I really want to underscore that. We, we operated completely independently of Bill. You, you were actually quite wary of us when we first approached you. Um, ultimately agreed to participate. Um, and... Uh, and we spent, as I said, months and months trying to get Herbalife to actively participate and ended up putting up 
their point of view through the public material that they made available and through an interview we licensed from Giselle Fernandez. It's, I think in my mind, from people who support Herbal Life that I've spoken to, they said we didn't miss a data point. It was a very fair um, uh, presentation of their point of view. Um, this didn't start uh, as an activist film. Uh, it started off as a film of inquiry and curiosity and we worked completely independently of Pershing Square and of Herbal Life. And uh, as you could see, the, the experiences of the distributors uh, the experts, as well as Pershing Square, were, were verified by the FTC statements. That's why we included them at the end of the film. And uh, the statements of uh, Herbalife's executives were, uh, were, were pretty well gutted by what the FTC had to say at the end. Um, we have time for one more. We have somebody where? Right there David, in, the, in, the, in the orange. Go ahead. Yes. Um, obviously, the object would be to get the most eyeballs to see this. What are the plans for distribution? We're in active discussions with a number of distribution companies now, and uh, we, we hope to have news to announce fairly shortly uh, by the end of the month, uh, God willing. Well, I just want to say that um, a couple things. One is that our next screening is... August 27th. August 27th, uh, that Saturday, is our uh, last summer doc, which is the what we're calling you know, the classic documentary, um, The Perfect Candidate, by uh, R.J. Cutler and David Van Taylor about the uh, uh, Chuck Robb, Oliver North Senate race in Virginia in 1996. 94. 44, rather. And, uh, and uh, thank you all. We're sorry for the little technical difficulties. And I want to finish by saying that, I mean, at the point that you realize, I mean, this is a, I don't know you, but I feel like I get to know you through the film. At the point you realize, I, I've said this to other people before, uh, that you realize you've made enough money, you've been very successful financially, which is a, a wonderful thing. Uh, I, I always find it's funny how pe people in America, there, there's the envy where we're in America. We're like, I thought part of the deal was, you know, you try to succeed as best you can. And we have this wonderful uh, game board here we can play on. People can make a lot of money. But people are like, well, we don't want you to make too much money. And if you make too much money, then, then you're a bad person. You know, I'm, I'm always kind of mystified by that, that discussion of <clears throat> damning people who are wealthy and so forth. But I hope that at the point you realize you've had enough, that you do something else with your life, because I think there's a lot of other things inside you you could do with your life other than make money. And there's a lot, of, I think there's a lot, of, I think, but I think there's a lot of great things you could do to help people. You seem like a very compassionate person. And of course, you're monetizing this thing and, and, and it's part of your investment uh, career. But at the same time, there's the, the guy you see up in this film, there's a lot of other things I'd like to see that guy too. There's very, that, that guy up there is more interesting than just that one kind of career, so. I'm trying to compliment you. Anyway, here we go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.